alone. You're in a place that you've never been, and you're surrounded by individuals that you have never met. It's a bit loud, it might smell a little funny, and the environment seems thick with uncertainty and maybe a twinge of fear. You're not quite sure how to get your next meal or where you're going to be sleeping tonight. If I was going to ask you to pick which individual I'm talking about on the screen behind me, could you make a choice? And if you could make a choice, would it matter? I'm going to say to you, that choice doesn't matter because every choice that you would make matters. And the reason that every choice would matter is because we all matter. Scientists have told us that we are a lot more alike than we are different, and quite honestly, we're all playing with the same hardware, the same brains, the same nervous systems, the same chemicals coursing through our bodies that allow us to think and allow us to feel. So whether you're running a feline operating system, a canine operating system, human or otherwise, your life matters to you because you can enjoy it and you can pursue things that are pleasurable and you can suffer your life. And you can try to avoid things that might cause you harm. So if that is true that we all really do matter, we need to talk about this number. And that is the 8 million lives that end up homeless in animal shelters in the United States every single year. A good majority of those are ending up there because they're just not getting along. The dog that barks and growls at the neighbor or the cat who pees outside the litter box. Of that 8 million, 2.7 million of them, healthy and adoptable, end their life in an animal shelter. Above and beyond that number, there's another percentage of those that are deemed unhealthy and unadoptable due to significant medical and behavioral concerns. That's a lot of animals, a lot of lives that matter. So you may think that I'm starting a talk about the no-kill shelter philosophy and how do we work to save them all. And while that's a very admirable goal, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. I'm actually here to talk about euthanasia. And I'm here to talk about what goes into that choice. Because as a shelter worker myself, who is faced with this decision, it's incredibly serious. It really is an albatross to bear. Because you have to keep a lot of things in balance with those choices. Things like, can I provide for this animal's needs and maintain a quality of life while it's in our care? Is that life worth something? And how much is it worth? And then I have to keep my community at large in view because I'm also tasked with making sure that any animals that go out of my doors really are safe and stable, that they're not presenting a risk to the community. That's a lot to balance in that decision. So I started asking some questions, and that led to some research that I did as part of my master's thesis in anthrozoology. And so I started looking at who makes that choice in our animal shelters? Not only who, but how do they go about gathering information so they can make a decision to euthanize or not? And then what information are they really looking to gather? And how is, does that infor, in, influence their choice? And then once they have it all, what ethical considerations must they keep in mind as they look at the individual in front of them and make a decision to euthanize or not? Because this is what really matters when it comes down to it. Those relationships that happen once that animal is placed on an adoption floor and finds a home. These are real people who've adopted real animals from shelters. And I simply asked on social media, can you send me some pictures of the shelter animals you've adopted that show you with your relationship with them? This is only a handful of what I got. So this is important stuff to talk about because those lives and those relationships matter. So the first question I asked was who? And when I did my survey, the results were a bit astounding and honestly a little disheartening to me. Because when I asked who is choosing life or death in an animal shelter, in my survey, over 80% of the respondents indicated that 
There were no animal behavior professionals, the people best tasked to make these choices because they understand the human and the animal behavior. Over 80% of them said that those people were not involved in these choices, especially when it's behavior-based euthanasia. They simply weren't there. That's a problem. We need to do better. We need to be demanding that our shelters put behavioral welfare first because that's really why many of these animals are at risk in the first place. So we need to be employing the right people and giving them an appropriate salary to do so, so that we are making sure the people that have the best experience are making the decisions about how to move forward with the animals in our care. And then I asked how. How do you gather information to make such a serious choice? And so I went back and looked at not only what happens in my facility, but in my research, and I found that while sometimes an owner may surrender an animal and tell you a little bit about them, you may watch them in your facility, many shelters are actually weighing very heavily the results of behavior assessments. So a series of tests that are given to animals, we see how they respond, and then we decide to move forward or not based on what happens. The problem is, are those assessments really working for us? Are they working for the animals in our care? Because I guarantee if I plopped any of you into a strange environment like I described at the beginning of this talk and asked you to behave normally, it might be a little hard to do so. And what they found is that the shelter environment is high stress. It's not the same as home. There are no relationships with the people like you would have in a home setting. And so therefore, your behavior is probably not going to be a real true reflection of who you are. And that's exactly what they found. One study actually found that of animals that had passed, so declared safe, had passed an assessment, put on the adoption floor and adopted out, just like my buddy Sherlock, who you see there, and isn't he cute? That's my boy. And he was adopted from an animal shelter, but he is a statistic. He is one of 41% of dogs who, post-adoption, within 13 months was displaying aggressive behavior. So that assessment did not identify that dog that you see on the screen. We still love him. He still has a wonderful home. But, um, but we did have some problems that we had to deal with. So the how we're gathering that information isn't really doing a good job. And so research scientists started to kind of jump on this and say, wait, what's going on here? So we started looking at what? And we're going to talk a little bit about what types of information those assessments are gathering. Are they gathering information that matters anyway? So one item that's pretty standard across most assessments is a food test. So you may or may not feed the dog overnight, hasn't had anything to eat, and then you put a bowl of food in front of it, you use a fake hand because you're hoping not to injure yourself, you approach the animal, you maybe fiddle with the food bowl a little bit, try to move it, or you touch or pet the dog and see how the dog reacts. Well, I guarantee you, if you put me in that situation with a key lime pie, you're gonna see me look like that. <laughs> and that is because I'm gonna do normal things to protect something important to me, my food. And dogs that growl, snarl, so showing teeth, doing those things are engaging in normal canine behavior. They're being a dog. They're using behaviors that in their language says, we need to change things so I don't have to hurt you. I want to prevent any harm. And yet, when we see those behaviors, our guts tense up, and we get nervous, and we killed a lot of dogs because of it. And when research scientists started looking at this particular test item, they found that dogs who had actually displayed this behavior in a shelter, of, of that group that went home, 55% still did so but 45% never displayed that behavior in a home setting. So that's potentially 45% of dogs that ended their life because they were being normal, because of an assessment that was based on a human standard, not a canine one. Now, the test did a little better the other way around. If they didn't display this in the shelter, they typically didn't at home, but we still misidentified a fifth of dogs who did display aggressive behaviors around a food bowl in a home setting. So our tests, so what we're testing didn't do a good job. And then we asked people, did it really matter what the dog did? And would that affect if you took that dog home or adopted it? And most adopters said no. So we're testing for things that didn't matter in a home environment, for the most part. 
So this obviously leads us to a big problem. And that is that really when it comes to behavior-based euthanasia, we're talking about risk assessment. How likely is that individual to harm someone, specifically a human, in the future? Because we take risk to our own species way more serious than we take risk to any other non-human species. So we're looking at this. But can we really sentence an animal to die based on the fact that we think they might engage in a behavior in the future without any history that they've done so in the past? I don't know. That's an answer for you to think about. But I will say, if we're going to say yes, we need to be pretty darn certain of what our predictions are. And we need to know that we're getting them right. Because right now, a lot of animals are paying the consequences for behaviors that they've never committed yet. And we don't even govern our own species this way, and arguably we might be the most ag aggressive species on this planet. So we really need to ask ourselves, is the collateral damage of killing good animals in animal shelters based on assessments that may not be valid, may not be reliable, have low predictive value, and are interpreted by people who don't have the expertise to really understand it, is that something that we as a community can live with? Ask yourself that question. Because you are part of this community, and your shelters are part of your community, and you need to be helping them understand what's important moving forward. So while you're talking in your mind, maybe to your neighbor, about this big idea here, what I want you to think about is this still comes back to an individual life, like Cyan. Cyan was an individual who was confiscated from an alleged dogfighting operation and was terrified of the world. He had been brought to a shelter and had been assessed. His handling assessment, his resource assessment was uneventful. He was pretty scared, so really didn't do much. But his dog-dog assessment was inconclusive at best. Now, given his previous situation, we would think that's an important piece to think about, right? Is he safe? Is he going to harm someone in the future? And do we need to end his life because of that? So this is a case study I presented in my research on my survey, and I asked, who would make the decision on this animal? Sadly, only 17% of the job titles listed by my respondents could be identified as behavior staff. And none of them listed as credentialed or having expertise in canine behavior, particularly dog-dog. And when I asked what would happen to him, 61% said maybe. That is a huge gray area to leave up to people who don't have the expertise, and we're yet asking them to make this serious, very weighty decision about this animal. What would you do? Luckily, Cyan landed in a place where there was a credential behavior professional, me, and we were able to put together a plan. We were able to assess risk in pursuing that plan and then executing it. And what happened was what you see. He learned to live with other dogs, mine, and cats. He loved cats. Go figure. And he was adopted out to a family. And when I asked that family post-adoption about a year later to tell me what it meant to have Cyan in their life, they said, I can't even explain how much this dog touched my heart. That is important. Those things matter. His life mattered, and therefore the lives he touched mattered. But it's not just dogs. Cats have an even difficult, more difficult situation because there are very fewer feline behavior specialists, right? So he was picked up by some Good Samaritans, carried into the shelter, and put in a carrier, walked into the infirmary for a preliminary Medicare, medical check, and that's when I was told everything hit the fan. He was labeled aggressive, he was labeled dangerous, he was labeled unsafe. He was held for straight time by law, and then, now what? I asked that now what question in my survey. Only 20% of the job titles listed that would make the choice about his life were behavior staff, and none of them listed as any experience with feline behavior. And when I asked what would happen, 
54% indicated they weren't sure. That's a lot of uncertainty about a life that matters. Again, fortunately, Aries landed in a place where I was fortunate enough to meet him. And now, Aries is a very important part of my family. And I shudder to think what would have happened had he not landed somewhere where someone like me who can understand him as, and translate that to humans, what would happen? Where would he be? And I guarantee you, he probably wouldn't be alive. Because we did have to work hard to rehabilitate him. And as you can see now, he is a really productive member of my family. And I wouldn't have it any other way. He's awesome, isn't he? Pretty cool. Even the dogs think he's OK, too. And yes, that is Sherlock way in the back there, eyeing him up. But in the end, what we really need to think about is we're talking about in motion today. So how do we move forward? We move forward by having the right people in the right positions. That means credentialed animal behavior professionals working with shelters to make these tough choices. That means research scientists helping us understand how to improve the tools that we currently have so that we are better at predicting future behavior so we make better, safer choices for everyone involved. Because there's no other time when you need to be more certain about your choice than when it's to end a life or to save one. Because in the end, we don't all matter just because we matter to ourselves. We matter because we're important to every single life that we touch. Thank you.